Hello, and welcome to the Futurum Tech webcast. This show is part of our 5G Factor series, where my colleague here at Futurum Research, Ron Westfall, and I talk about all things 5G, the news, the ecosystem, the opportunities, and all things 5G. So, Ron, welcome. It's great to see you today. Well, you bet, Shelley, and uh, it's great to see you. I, I feel cheer in the air. So this is going to be, I think, a great way to address uh, 5G as 2021 uh, wraps up. That's right. Cheer in the air. That's always a good thing. Cheer in the air. <laughs> so we are going to start the show talking about our friends at Marvell and their new Atlas One chip, which is all about expanding the company's 5G ecosystem-wide influence. And let's let's talk a little bit about this chip set offering, Ron. I know that you covered um, Marvell's Industry Analyst Day here, and so fill us in. Oh, you bet, Shelley. And yes, uh, I know Daniel Newman, our chief analyst, and Nigel Alvarez, the uh, VP of uh, Solutions Marketing, also uh, talked about the analyst event in a, a webcast, mm -hmm. and that is a recap of you know everything that Marvell addressed that day. Here for 5G Factor, I want to drill down on the Atlas One uh, chipset debut, which is right. very important, uh, not just uh, only for you know Marvell's ability to expand that 5G ecosystem influence, but you know for uh, the entire industry. And uh, on the technical specs side, it's a 50 gig uh, PAM4 uh, ch chipset. And what it does, is it aligns with the mobile network operators expanding demand for front hall capabilities that scale beyond uh, 25 gigabits. And that uh, also uh, requires uh, lowering uh, power uh, consumption. And uh, this chipset actually lowers power consumption by 25%. So 25 is like a magic number here right. uh, because it's adding 25 gigabits to the overall bandwidth capacity while reducing uh, power consumption requirements by uh, 25%. But also in addition, it's enabling more flexible shifting of uh, bandwidth capacity in the front hall uh, realm. And that's going to be important because we know that unexpected spikes in uh, mobile traffic can cause interruption in service. And sometimes it's due to this part of the network. And uh, with this new integrated capability, mobile operators will have just that, you know, the agility to respond more dynamically to unusual traffic or, again, those uh, traffic surges uh, that can be unexpected and as a result maintain you know continuity of quality of service and so forth for uh, 5g in addition it's also i think uh, delivering uh, some important uh, capabilities such as edge optimization again lowering the footprint and lowering mm -hmm. that power consumption to lower quite simply overall solution costs for opt uh, optical electro uh, capabilities in the front hall segment of the network also, it's supporting integrated security, which is important, as we know, across the board, in particular, right. uh, MacSec uh, capabilities, uh, which is Ethernet link security. And combining that with other security capabilities, such as routing level IPsec, uh, helps the operator prevent things like those dreaded distributed denial of service attacks and more very important. All the nasty stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, and very important because CDOS attacks are on the rise that they have been absolutely off the charts in the last year and that is not expected to slow down any at anytime soon if ever so this is really you know baked in security is tremendously important oh no doubt and so yeah the timing is actually uh, very uh well received yeah. And uh, in addition, it's also uh, enabling uh, segment routing uh, capabilities. And what's the innovation here is that it's supporting uh, source-based uh, routing information to improve traffic engineering capabilities. Uh, before uh, segment routing uh, was uh, more available, uh, the carriers had to basically deal uh, with you know, having to look up network state information at transit routers and transit nodes, and that just added complexity and delay. And so uh, with uh, the support of segment routing capabilities uh, baked into the chip, that will definitely improve the overall efficiency of uh, 5G networks, particularly in the front hall uh, segment. And uh, so I think uh, what's also important here is that 
uh, Marvell is definitely uh, uh, advancing uh, the ORAN and the VRAN capabilities that mobile network operators are putting more emphasis on. Right. Uh, the ORAN Alliance clearly was formed uh, just for that uh, very capability. And uh, it's uh, it combining uh, uh, the Atlas One capabilities with other uh, Marvell uh, product lines, such as the Octian Fusion uh, chipsets, and as well as the Prestera. Uh, um, uh, switching capabilities that uh, it shows that Marvell is really spreading its wings more, that it's becoming just more integral to how, you know, any uh, supplier is going to strategically advance uh, 5G networking capabilities, not just in the front hall, but in terms of, you know, the end to end uh, 5G networking. And this is important because obviously the operators are betting and need for new applications to win and take off. That includes ultra reliable, low latency communications uh, that we see throughout, for example, manufacturing and industrial environments. Right. Also, it's uh, supporting, uh, again, that dynamic sharing of the capacity across radio units to you know, quite simply make the 5G network more efficient. And finally, also supporting uh, new applications such as fixed wireless access, as well as hybrid workforce. And you know, combine all these together, and it's just a, a winning combination for operators. And I think we really are uh, becoming more uh, close to seeing these become mainstream, uh, becoming you know, quite simply uh, monetized because of innovations like uh, the Atlas One uh, chipset. So uh, right. this is uh, good news for the 5G ecosystem, for sure. Absolutely. Good news and exciting news. So that's awesome. And I'll be sure and link that um, interview of Daniel's um, into the show notes here so that if you're watching or listening to this broadcast and you want to also see that conversation, we'll make it easy for you. So we're going to transition on and talk now about T-Mobile and the next phase of 5G. So I had the opportunity earlier in the week to listen to, sit in on um, an AMA on Reddit, which is an Ask Me Anything featuring T-Mobile's Neville Ray. And it was an interesting conversation. You know, sometimes those things just kind of stumble, you know, you're thrown across your field of vision. You think, wait, I'm going to make time to see what's going on there and what Neville has to say. So one of the uh, key questions, there were a lot of questions that came Ray's way. One of the questions that was particularly of interest to me focused on small cells and MM wave uh, strategy that some of T-Mobile's competitors in the telco space have kind of bet on uh, as being the, the way to go. And uh, Ray's comments did not surprise on this topic specific to MM wave. In fact, he didn't really pull any punches. He made it clear that for T-Mobile, um, they believe that MM Wave is not the best way or the right way to build a nationwide 5G network that can support um, mobile applications. This is a really popular topic of conversation when T-Mobile's involved. And their offerings instead rely on what they call kind of a layer cake approach. And this is a mix of low, mid, and high band spectrum. And they've got some interesting things. I know that uh, right after the, the merger with Sprint, T-Mobile turned on its newly integrated 2.5 gigahertz spectrum in New York City and in Philadelphia. And, um, and this 2.5 gigahertz um, comprises part of this layer cake that we're talking about. And then this also includes low band 600 millihertz and MM wave 28 gigahertz spectrum. So it truly is kind of a mix of things. And I think T-Mobile has also um, in some of their marketing messaging and that sort of thing relied on a some layer cake imagery and messaging. So I thought that was interesting. And I, I'm sure you have some thoughts on that, Ron. Yeah, in addition to the fact that Layer Cake is an outstanding British film, but it's also <laughs> an outstanding a philosophy in terms right. of how T-Mobile built out its nationwide 5G network. And I think uh, Neville has a, a valid point in terms of how right. this is played out. I think uh, if uh, you look at Verizon, they led uh, more with the millimeter wave uh, capabilities and bet right. more heavily on that. Now, what we saw earlier this year, they have subsequently bought up a lot of mid-band spectrum to, right. in essence, uh, make their uh, nationwide build up more of a layer cake uh, type well. of approach. Right. And uh, so I think it's uh, fair to say that T-Mobile has, you know, a time to 
market or you know time to deploy advantage here and you know executing that strategy because what is sometimes misunderstood it doesn't mean t-mobile is uh eschewing a uh, millimeter wave or you know small cells they have invested heavily in both those technologies but again it's part of that layer cake uh, blended approach uh, it's right. also you know technology that can help the overall 5g experience and it's just a question of how the prioritization rolled out and you know who has i guess a more compelling strategy certainly on the consumer side in terms of enabling you know broader coverage uh, enabling uh, more compelling applications in the near term and so forth as a result right. and uh, so i think uh, the spotlight is also now on t-mobile's uh, use of n41 2.5 uh, gigahertz right. uh, 5g Just take the words uh, right out of my mouth Ron. Just take the <laughs> words right out of my mouth yeah you know sometimes uh, i sometimes i have to slow ron's roll because <laughs> he gets started and then he just like gobbles up everything that i'm going to talk about so ron i'm not going to let you gobble it up <laughs> <laughs> no you're absolutely right though the n41 which is in 2.5 gigahertz 5G and nationwide carrier aggregation for 5G have been key areas of focus. And one of the things that Ray talked about in this AMA is that T-Mobile expects to begin delivering NRCA by the end of 2021. And he went on to say that the next phase of T-Mobile's NRCA focus will be on increasing the 2.5 gigahertz mid-band spe spectrum beyond 100 megahertz. Is it megahertz? Megahertz. Megahertz. Oh, right? yeah. And he also <laughs> hit on, well, you know, sometimes you have all these acronyms. You're like, wait a minute. Take it right? <laughs> right. And then he also hit on the fact that cost, this is exciting, that customers could look forward to experience a significant boost in throughput. Um, and this will be available initially to customers using Apple's newest iPhone 13, and then it'll expand to other devices in the first quarter of 2022. So I thought that was really good news. And, um, you know, one thing that I wanted to uh, wrap up this conversation about T-Mobile on, I know it's interesting to you, Ron, as well, but um, so, so Neville covered a, a wide range of topics and questions, including the company's stance on Open RAND, uh, Open RAND and then, of course, T-Mobile's transition to voice over new radio and voice over LTE. Um, but, uh, but I know that the company has had some, some challenges with or some thoughts about Open RAN, um, and they're kind of going slowly as it relates to that. Yes, definitely. I, I think that's another uh, stark contrast, you know, yeah. with uh, a Verizon, AT and T, at least in terms of you know the marketing aspect of uh, Open RAN or ORAN right. uh, Alliance uh, specific uh, initiative, as well as uh, VRAN for that matter. Sure. And uh, I think uh, that's refreshing because T-Mobile is basically the tonic, if you will, in terms of you know just how ready for prime time is right. uh, Open RAN technology really, and you know. I think uh, in their own testing, they've come up with some you know, valid uh, you know, security issues, uh, again, that scaling, uh, flexibly uh, issues, and so forth. And you know, each network is going to have its distinct profiles. So some of the things that are T-Mobile concerns might not necessarily apply you know, to other operators, whether you know, here in the US or in other parts of the world, such as you know, Vodafone and right. uh, Telefonica, who have been you know, like cheerleaders uh, for Open RAN. And, and I think it's, it's a process, it's a journey. I, I think, yes, there is the hype cycle that uh, we all are very familiar with in our industry, let alone other industries. And op Open RAN definitely had that initial flush. You know, uh, operators like Rakuten uh, definitely uh, put, I think, some fire under, you know, making it more <laughs> interesting and attractive Absolutely. to uh, talk about. And uh, it, again, I, I believe as the standards uh, mature, as, you know, the technology uh, becomes uh, better optimized and so forth, that in uh, variably open RAN will become, you know, a, a more significant mix of the overall RAN market. Right. And uh, I, I know, you know, it's been very low single digits uh, today. And, you know, by 2025, there is the expectation it can hit, you know, that 10 percent threshold. So that could be, a, you know, a realistic expectation. Uh, obviously, T-Mobile right. probably won't be contributing to that 
uh, particular uh, market growth. And I think, uh, you know, uh, circling back to Marvell, that we're also noting like, uh, yes, when it comes to, for example, VRAN capabilities, what we're looking to, to prove with our chipset technology is that it can uh, at least be on par with traditional RAN technology in terms of performance and security. And uh, with that, uh, then all these new capabilities can really uh, come to the forefront, you know, involving uh, obviously uh, third party application and innovation being uh, leveraged, uh, being able to uh, use, you know, cloud capabilities uh, on a much more extensive uh, basis. Uh, and, and in other words, you know, being able to accelerate, uh, you know, time to content, time to uh, market and all those right. important um, factors when mobile operators are looking at, you know, how do they really differentiate themselves? Right. So, yeah, yeah, I think it's just refreshing that, you know, here's, you know, uh, fundamental differences in philosophy. And you know, T-Mobile is, I think, uh, making a good case on behalf of their uh, aims and uh, on behalf of their, you know, uh, network uh, requirements. And, uh, and it's, you know, playing out where uh, T-Mobile can, you know, uh, I think objectively make uh, some uh, claims in terms of, you know, the 5G foot race when it comes to at least, right. you know, nationwide consumer services. Uh, but yeah, there's there's still uh, a lot of journey ahead of us and, oh, you know, lots of uh, variables and, and wild cards, as we know, can always pop up. <laughs> absolutely. And, you know, lastly, in this conversation focused on T-Mobile, um, and also because CES coming up, the Consumer Electronics Show is coming up in early January. And if you'll be there, our team from Futurum will be there as well. So, you know, hopefully we can meet up. But one of the things that Neville Ray was asked um, as part of this AMA was, you know, tell us about some of the, the technology you're most excited about. And since these are all things that our team is particularly bullish on, I thought I'd throw them out there. And so he's, um, you know, excited about wearables, smart apparel, biometric devices, AR, VR glasses and headsets, um, home internet, and, and really how um, the company plans on disrupting the status quo as it relates to bringing um, great internet access, reliable, fast internet access to the millions and millions of people across the United States who don't have that. So anyway, it was I thought it was a great conversation. I was glad I stumbled across it and, um, you know, look for more good things from the T-Mobile team, I'm sure. Naturally. Yes. Uh, stay tuned uh, because uh, things are heating up more as, you know, the 5G standalone now becomes uh, more implemented. And uh, as a result, uh, that will enable, you know, some of the more uh, creative uh, use cases that we've been hearing about right. uh, as they finally start transitioning away from the necessary uh, you know, initial 5G non-standalone implementations, which was, you know, the blending of, you know, LTE core capabilities with 5G radio capabilities. Right. And, you know, that inherently introduced, you know, complexity and, uh, but it was necessary to really get, you know, 5G set up. And uh, so this is definitely, I think, uh, an event uh, horizon here that's coming up <laughs> for the mobile industry. That is 2022. Yeah. Uh, there really is, you have to really put up, you know, some you know, uh, compelling 5G services, uh, compelling uh, 5G uh, use cases uh, right. to really you know, justify the investment that's occurred across the board, certainly in terms of mobile spectrum auctions, but also investment in the equipment and so forth. Uh, but we all know that the, the primary uh, uh, money investment trail is into 5G. So yeah. it's it's going to be a solid bet, uh, certainly, uh, I would say, for the next two years. Uh, with, you know, uh, for example, fixed wireless being a, a second highest priority uh, due, you know, to things like wi hybrid workforce um, being uh, uh, more prominent. And uh, so this, I think, uh, is just uh, going to advance, you know, the 5G ecosystem. It's going to enable some of these innovations to really take hold. And I think T-Mobile definitely will be a key part of the mix, especially as, you know, new devices become uh, commercially right. available uh, right. in Absolutely. the market. Absolutely. With that, we're going to take a turn and we're going to talk about new devices. And we're going to specifically talk about great, great positioning there, Ron. We're going to talk about Apple's soon to be released iPhone SE 5G and really how that presents an opportunity. So, you know, the reality of it is that uh, affordable mobile devices are 
big in many markets and they're incredibly attractive. And Olivier Blanchard, one of our analysts here at Futurum has covered this topic quite often. Um, and so we have, a, I'll share some content related to that and really what's ahead and, and some of the key players in driving lower to mid-range devices, including Qualcomm, who are doing some great things with chips. But in any event, um, the Apple's, Apple's new iPhone SE 5G is newsworthy and something to kind of get excited about because um, it has the ability to attract somewhere in the neighborhood of almost a billion and a half non-premium Android users to the Apple ecosystem. And, you know, the thing about iPhones is they're great, uh, but they're not cheap. And they never have been cheap. <laughs> and, you know, for instance, the newest iPhone 13 and the 13 Pro start somewhere between $799 and $999. I can promise you, I, you know, I always kind of go with sort of not the lowest in terms of storage, but kind of, you know, I mean, I think the days of having to have the phone with the biggest storage for me anyway have gone away because I replace them so often. But, but replacing an iPhone is expensive. And, um, I think there's a gigantic customer base who hold on to phones longer um, and or who are using Android devices who might be interested in an Apple device. And I think this is and, and that mid, that low to rid, mid range category has largely been dominated by my mouth is not working today, largely been dominated today by the likes of Samsung and Huawei. And I think that's about to change, especially as we see the demand for 5G phones remaining strong and continuing to grow. So the news about Apple here is that they're expect the company is expected to launch this 5G SE phone in early 2022. The current iPhone SE is priced at about $399. And it's safe to say that price should remain somewhat consistent, should be expected to remain somewhat consistent with the new model. But this lower price point, I mean, there's a huge difference between $799 and $399, right? Um, but this difference com combined with Apple's trade-in program, which isn't fantastic. I mean, it's okay. Um, but if you've got an older phone that you've been hanging on to, you know, you're going to get $25 or <laughs> Fifty dollars. Um, I just tend to hold on to them all, and then I nostalgically look back at them and go, "Oh, remember when phones were so little?" Um, but anyway, so it could mean an entry price point of between two sixty nine and three ninety nine, which is expected to be really attractive. So. Anyway, that's on the horizon and analysts are talking about how, you know, not only will this be is expected to be attractive to um, somewhere in the neighborhood of, gosh, I think 300,000 folks who are holding on to an older model iPhone and then 1.4 billion low to, low to mid range Android users. So that's a big upside for Apple. Oh, I agree. And yes, that is ambitious. Anytime you hear a billion, that's always going to uh, draw <laughs> eyeballs. Right? And in this case, yeah, uh, almost you know, 1.5 uh, billion Android users are the target. And uh, I think we can anticipate not every single Android user is going to convert oh, to absolutely Apple. Not. absolutely <laughs> not. However, it will be uh, disruptive as long as you know the execution's uh, reasonably smooth. And I think you... Uh, put an excellent point there, uh, Shelley, uh, in terms of, you know, the 269 to 399 uh, price tag. Yes, we can anticipate that Android best, uh, based uh, smartphones will counter that. Right. But, you know, the difference between, say, a 269 phone and a 239 phone could be uh, not compelling if somebody's really looking for, you know, a new smartphone experience. And, right. uh, and I think this is also, again, fueling what we talked about, 5G becoming more mainstream, particularly standalone right. implementations. And this will make, you know, an Apple uh, iPhone offering this price range uh, attractive because as we know, uh, Apple delayed you know, supporting 5G in its initial right. uh, iPhone uh, offerings. And, and so this is definitely uh, going to be, uh, you know, shifting the competitive landscape. And I, I guess the only uh, notable concern uh, right away is, again, the supply chain issues, uh, you know, that, you know, Apple is now committed to uh, making its own chipsets uh, right. specifically for smartphone uh, capabilities. And uh, so uh, that has to be factored into, you know, how soon 
uh, will uh, these uh, new Apple iPhones uh, make an impact? And uh, so, yeah, that this is going to be good for the consumer. Yeah. It's going to you know inject uh, more, more competition and uh, definitely, uh, I think, uh, uh, make it more uh, compelling uh, for somebody to cover to an iPhone now before, you know, uh, just, you know, looking at that premier set of customers. So right. uh, this is good. Uh, I think I'm so. looking forward to, uh, you know, kicking the tires on it potentially for, you know, uh, for the kids, you know, things like that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Your kids are, you know, almost old enough. They're going to be dating with their phones. <laughs> Yay! I remember those days. Um, so now we're going to wind up our 5G factor conversation with a look at Ericsson's 10 hot consumer trends report. Report that outlines 10 high tech facilities that customers envision finding in hybrid malls by 2030, where every space becomes a networked reality and suited for what they're calling a next gen experience. And, you know, this is what's particularly of interest to me, Ron. I know you surfaced this um, and suggested we talk about it on our show, but, you know, we did a report in partnership with SAS called. Um, uh, customer experience 2030, the future of, uh, you know, customer experience is now. And we looked at key trends. This was published in 2020, I believe, or maybe 2019. And then we did a pulse survey updating it in 2020. But we looked at a lot of these trends and what, um, you know, customers told us they were expecting in terms of what's ahead and what customer experiences would be like. And many of those things included things like VR and AR experiences and more experiential events and things like that. So I thought this was really, uh, I thought this was really kind of interesting. And some of the things that the Erickson report touched on were things like um, beauty salons that used technology to digitally enhance looks, which is something that seven out of 10 consumers who responded to this Ericsson research said that they expected and were looking forward to. And things like hybrid gyms and mental fitness centers that have things like multi-sensory personality tailored AR and VR scenery that's intended and designed to help improve mental health. So can you imagine like, hey, Ron, let's go to the mall, you know, and, and this is really what, <laughs> what, let's go to the mall. And instead of, you know, going to Banana Republic or wherever it is you go, I actually, I personally head straight to Auntie Annie's for some pretzel dogs. Um, but, you know, I can say let's go to the mall because I want to do something that's focused on improving my mental health. I mean, like, I think that's really exciting, really cool. Another part of the trends that the team at Ericsson um, – uncovered is the restaurant of the future where, you know, Ron lives in outside of Dallas and I live in Kansas city, but we could have an experience where, you know, we're having dinner with each other um, virtually um, by way of this technology that um, we're talking about. So I thought that those were good and probably let's see that I had a couple of other things I was going to hit on, you know, a medical multiplex, which is an in mall center where you can drop in and have AI powered health screenings. And that gives you like instant, near instant health status updates. Like, so anybody who's ever gone to the doctor, right? You have something wrong with you. You, you know, sometimes you have to wait for a while to see your doctor. Then they say, oh yeah, you're right. You do have something wrong with you. Then they send you for a test you know, that you have to wait a week for, and then you have to wait three weeks to get back into your doctor <laughs> to get the test, right? So think how cool that could be. Um, and lastly, the other thing that got me with my, um, I am a tree hugger extraordinaire, as my husband likes to call me, but the multi-factory that allows consumers to shop sustainably in a factory outlet that also recycles their own products. So, you know, a, a retailer like Patagonia is doing this already, right? You can bring your Patagonia gear into almost any store that sells Patagonia stuff and you can, you know, recycle the company reuses it. But those kind of things I think are really interesting. I mean, those are really interesting to me. So, Ron, what stuck out for you in term in, from this Ericsson hot consumer trends report? Oh, yeah. Now, this is, uh, I think, a very insightful, valuable report for yeah. the industry, certainly uh, the 5G uh, market. This is the 11th edition. So yeah. Yeah, Ericsson Labs is definitely Doing continuing to, I think, 
yeah, pinpoint uh, you know, these most uh, interesting insights. And uh, yeah, I, I think one that has the most direct relevance to 5G today is the one that had the highest rating amongst the uh, respondents, 80% believe like the all new arena. Right. Uh, will be pretty much integral to what they anticipate will be being streamed, you know, certainly by 2030. But I think we're already seeing it. Oh, you and I have talked about stadium. this. We've talked about this on our show. It feels right. like a thousand <laughs> times. I mean, the AT&T Stadium, uh, is that in Dallas? I mean, there's a, there's several yeah, different- T-Mobile in Seattle. Oh, yeah. Exactly. I mean, there's exactly. Just, so know. this is not new and it's, and it's ha- you're, like you said, it's happening already. So totally makes sense. Anyway, go on. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I, I wanted to touch on the fact <laughs> oh, that this is like, been, you and I have been talking about this for a long time. <laughs> well, it shows you how exciting and fun this is. Yeah, this yeah. aspect, you know, like, all yeah. right, what, it, what can we really anticipate that will be really neat? Yeah. And uh, so it's not just, you know, uh, stadium experiences, but also what could be called a smart theater experience you know it's yeah. just an immersive experience using ar vr capabilities uh right. that allow you know the the customer to uh, create you know that uh you know almost out of body experience uh, when uh when that previously that was not just uh possible right I, I think the another one that um i thought was interesting uh was the meta tailor application 70 percent thought that would be uh, pretty much widely available and that makes sense because anybody who knows who's been you know fitted for a suit or you know uh, other important clothing uh knows that it could be uh somewhat time consuming to actually visit yeah. you know a, a tailoring uh outlet or you know a, a tailor shop and uh what this uh, what it enables that you have an avatar that will simply enable them to make the measurements based on that and therefore you know have the suit turn around in shorter time save right. everybody uh, time and it would actually, I think, uh, definitely link into you know, the whole idea of uh, metaverse or the metaverse of things becoming uh, you know more uh, prominent in terms of adoption. And so well, again, this is the universe, yeah, right. <laughs> as, as Erickson calls it, the universe. Right on, yeah, exactly. And yeah, that's a, another one I think that was interesting was the universe pool, yeah. uh, you know, where you can use an oxygenated virtual reality headset to uh, actually have a zero gravity experience while you're in the pool, you know, kind of a, a, sp- right. a space exploration emulation, uh, which as we know with, uh, you know, firms like SpaceX advancing space exploration, I think will become e- even of more interest, you know, to the general public. And and that one had actually up to two thirds support amongst the uh, uh, respondents. Right. So yeah, this is all, you know, demonstrating, validating uh, that uh, people aren't uh, going to be, you know, uh, looking at this through rose colored lenses. They're actually, you know, going to labs today, you know, testing this out and saying, you know what, this is something I would actually like to use. I like this. And I'd I go know to the from, mall. I'd go yeah, to the mall exactly, to use exactly. this stuff. And, and when I have actually had the opportunity to experience this, uh, it's just been uh, very rewarding. And I'm just looking forward to 5G, uh, you know, by 2036 G, maybe even 7G, you know, enabling uh, these uh, capabilities. Uh, and uh, this is, I, I think, uh, again, parallel the, uh, the SAS, you know, 2030 um, uh, uh, study that uh, this is something uh, that we can you know, put more uh, valid bets on, you know, that Absolutely. we can better anticipate, you know, where uh, we can um, develop the use cases, prioritize them, you know, uh, you know, again, follow that 5G money trail. And but after, you know, you get the 5G network in place, where can the operators and right. you know, other parties really uh, make uh, money off of you know, all this uh, very valuable investment? So, well, yeah, it's, it's a really cool study. <laughs> and <laughs> it's not just like. network operators and vendors, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I think that what we're seeing here and you know what Erickson has identified in this hot trends report is that you know cons- this impacts consumers too and our activities and our entertainment and you know I don't know about in your city but in my city malls are struggling right and there you know oh, people yeah. have shifted to um, e-commerce purchases and all that kind of thing and you know I go to probably the biggest mall that's I don't know 20 25 minutes away as infrequently as possible, because I just don't have any reason to go there. And um, so, you know, when you have a destination that is, that has plenty of space, 
but that I can go to not only to shop for clothes or shoes or whatever, but I can go to the hybrid gym kind of experience or a restaurant experience or a healthcare experience or, you know, seeing a concert, um, you know, watching, um, you know, my favorite performer perform virtually and having an opportunity to do that. I think all of those things are, I think that they're consumer driven. And, um, and I think that we're all sort of looking for different things to do, different experiences and that sort of thing. And these will be, you know, powered by 5G. Definitely. And in, in the near term and uh, definitely, you know, uh, future iterations of 5G, 5.5G. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I would anticipate, yeah, just that, you know, uh, 6G uh, when they become really mature that, you don't you don't think twice about it uh, type of scenarios. Right. And and so I think that this is helping, you know, guiding investment decisions, yeah. uh, helping the decision makers, you know, have a, a better uh, understanding as to you know, how to optimize, you know, the 5G networks of today and over the next uh, four years at least, and uh, definitely uh, this is something that will, I, I think, uh, be a difference maker. Having this data, having this information, right. uh, because uh, uh, you know a lot of this uh, 5G build is being driven, you know, by you know the industrial side, the business right. to business side, and you know private networks, for example, are definitely right. going to be more heavily invested into. But yes, definitely consumer applications are going to be major and, and it's definitely going to be an ecosystem just right. that you know 5g ecosystem imperative right. and uh, this I, I think uh, demonstrates why mm. well and it's part of the monetization process you know what I'm saying like when I'm going to the mall for the you know for the virtual gym or the mental health wellness I'm paying money <laughs> Right. Oh, I'm yeah. paying money for that experience. I'm paying money for the virtual concert. I'm paying money for the Taylor experience. And all of that is geared toward delivering up better, more streamlined, more efficient, more enjoyable customer experiences. And so I, I think it's really interesting stuff. So I will link in the show notes um, for this conversation. I will link the uh, Erickson Tot the Ericsson 10 Hot Consumer Trends Report. And I'll also share links to our research for SaaS on Customer Experience 2030 and what both brands and customers told us they want, expect, and uh, plan on seeing and using and having available within the next decade. So interesting stuff for sure. And with that, Ron, that's a wrap for our show today. The 5G factor for our watching audience, our viewing audience, or our listening audience. If you haven't yet subscribed, be sure and hit that subscribe button. Ron and I are here every week talking all things 5G. And um, I think with that, that's a wrap, Ron. Thanks for joining me as always. And we'll see you next week. Happy Merry Day. (laughs) Happy Merry Day. All right, we're out. (laughs) 